Good day. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Monday, November the 14th, 2022. We have Sebastian Mayo, CEO of DBox Technologies, and CFO David Montpetit joining us today. Uh, DBox creates haptic systems for theatrical venues, home entertainment, video game systems, and commercial training and simulation markets. DBox just reported its Q2 2023 financial results with revenues increasing 10%, including a 38% rise in its rights of use revenues. As well, the company posted its fifth consecutive quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA. Sebastian David will be reviewing the quarter and providing a business update and will be taking questions from the audience. Please remember this is neither a recommendation or investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Sebastian, David, thanks a lot for joining us. And uh, let's have a review of the quarter. Thank you, Martin, and welcome, everyone. Uh, We are really happy to have this opportunity to connect with you following the release of our second quarter result earlier today. Today, as we just said, we are going to briefly go over our second quarter financial highlights and then spend some time discussing two areas of particular significance during the quarter the launch of our G5 system, and the country expansion of our theatrical footprint. Uh, Yes, we're going to be focusing on those topics as we've decided from quarter to quarter to focus on some key aspects of the business. Of course, uh, first, I need to direct you to our disclaimer regarding forward-looking statement. I would like also to point out that all all dollars amount in this presentation are in Canadian dollars unless otherwise specified. So let's kick on with the financial highlights. So we'd like to start by looking at our revenue, which constitutes a trend upwards. Uh, Total revenue increased 10% to 6.1 million compared to the same quarter last year. Our right for use rental and maintenance revenue increased 38% to 1.8 million. So keeping that trend upward and our revenue related to the system sale increased 1% to 4.4 million. Important to note, Ju- J- July was DBOX's second best month ever in terms of number of tickets sold on a global basis, remembering that June was the first one ever. And it's important to call out that several system orders were pushed to the third quarter. Next slide. Our gross profit, excluding amortization related to cost of goods sold, increased to $3.3 million compared to 3 million in Q2 of last year. This increase, of course, is explained by the growth in the right for use, rental and maintenance revenue, which generated a higher margin. However, we were not immune to inflationary pressure impacting the cost of components and transportation for our system cell, which have set the growth in right for use, rental and maintenance revenue during the quarter. Accordingly, we have implemented increase in our standard price list in order to reduce the impact of increase to the cost of component and transportation. Our gross margin, excluding amortization, remains stable at 54%. Really, I'm really glad, importantly, this marks our fifth consecutive quarter with positive adjusted EBITDA. Martin, I'm sure you have some question for me. Yeah, so obviously some very good uh, growth on the rights of use uh, revenue there. Uh, we're coming out of the world of, of pandemic. Is that you've obviously announced recently some uh, expanded distribution uh, on the in the theater side, and we'll get to the theater business, but just generally on the revenue side, it's an uptick in the uh, theatric business. More people are putting bums in seats, uh, so to speak. Uh, which is uh, driving a lot of that revenue? Yes, so I will uh, refer to our Master of Finance, our CFO, David Montpetit, for financial questions. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Martin. So the, um, just to, to remind you that, uh, first of all, the theater- historically, the theatrical business is a seasonal business. Usually Q2 and Q4, financial Q2 and Q4 at D-Box is the the slowest, uh, the slowest quarter in terms of right of use because uh, uh, there's a direct, uh, it's linked directly to the uh, the new release from uh, Hollywood in terms of uh, movies, and uh, those quarter usually are the low, the slowest one in terms of new release and blockbuster. Uh, so this is why we have a variation in, in right of use. Also, as uh, uh, we have 69 uh, screen that we will. Uh, in the pipeline right now that will be uh, put in pl- uh, put in a function in the next few months uh, in some exhibitor that will create new right of use for 2023 and up 
and uh, that uh, we're still working to profitable growth within the theatrical business. And just to highlight, to make sure everyone realizes, your Q2 is not the calendar Q2. So your Q2 is the um, is the the summer period, which is uh, from July to September, where most of the time there is not a lot of new releases in terms of uh, blockbuster movies. So now we are in the in the the third quarter right now, and we have new movie that will especially big blockbuster like Black Panther that been released during the weekend and Avatar that will be released in December that are uh, we expecting a good result from those uh, those movie. All right. You made a um, the, the revenues were tempered by increased. Uh, oh, sorry. The um, some of the, the component parts orders were delayed. So that was a bit of a uh, on the non theatrical business. That was a bit of a, a headwind, so to speak, but presumably will be coming through shortly. Yes, yeah, so supply chain is uh, is still a, a, a huge challenge just to to synchronize a supplier's order with the, the customer order as well, and and make sure that everything uh, have the right timing. As uh, as you can know, uh, uh, Martin, is that uh, we still have uh, the zero policy COVID in China. Uh, their supplier capacity around the world, um, so that's create a lot of challenges and probably permanent changes also in the supply chain where we. We addressed that situation by investing during the last quarter in our inventory by having a deposit to our supplier to reserve uh, production capacity and also uh, uh, component availability for uh, uh, the order that we have right now in the pipeline and for next year as well. Gotcha. Um, with the inflation uh, impact, obviously that impacts the hardware sales. Your rights of use revenues is very high margin sort of licensing revenues. You have an increased pricing on that or it, it, the inflation and price increases haven't really affected that uh, income stream, has it? Um, no, um, for most of our revenue are in the US dollar. Also, we revised also uh, um, pr price last year to our uh, uh, product uh, offering. So we, we are able to manage uh, this uh, inflation component uh, very well within the last uh, few quarters. Gotcha. And with the inventory, increase in inventories, that's a partially to buffer with supply chain hiccups and so forth, but also a bit, just some orders had been delayed. So it just backed up the inventories a bit. Yeah. So we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we increase our inventory uh, supplier deposit for sure. It's just to make sure that we have the production capacity for next year and have, having the availability of component. Also, as I mentioned, the supply chain delays are longer than it was to get uh, order from suppliers. So we need to reserve this production capacity for a much more longer period than it was pre-COVID. So that's a kind of a insurance policy to deliver our customer orders and be uh, have a fulfillment rate uh, uh, very high. Okay. And then on seasonality, this past, this reported quarter here, this is typically one of your weaker quarters and presumably this quarter we're in right now, one would see a, a, a nice, uh, at least sequential increase in the revenues, especially on the rights of uh, use revenues, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, for sure. During summer, of course, uh, customers sometimes have, don't have a lot of of a big project or big uh, big important project to deliver. So that so usually the, the Q2 is usually the weakest quarter in terms of theatrical as well as the on the OEM business as well. All right. Okay. Well, I, I let's. Uh, I think we kind of covered the main points in uh, the financials. Unless there's something you want to bring up, and then we can move on to the rest of the presentation. I think we'll we'll move to the rest of the presentation. The only thing I could be saying is yes, as you mentioned, Martin, the economy is tough, recession, supply chain, but we are paid to find solution, and I'm happy uh, that the, what the type of solution has been put uh, by uh, David's team and the other people internally to optimize the throughput uh, uh, in, in the upcoming quarters for, for for generating revenues. All right, thank you. So now let's move. We talk about our G5, which are new system of actuator. So, so I wanted to spend a few minutes to mean what what it means for the business. So let's move to the next slide. So, so as you know, we are the leader in that market. So for investor, it's important to understand three things about our G5 system. Our G5 is easier to deploy, enable seamless integration of our aptic technology in many more devices. 
Second, really important, and an investor will love that, there is no assembly required by DBox. This improves our production throughput and allows us to fulfill customer order faster. We wanted to build scalability. That's way, one of the reasons that we built that scalability to that G5 supply chain structure. And third, of course, because it can integrate it into more devices, G5 allows us to target a much larger addressable market. Importantly, and we're talking about potential revenue, our G5 system is available today through our trusted network of partners located all around the world. So yes, Martin, we are able to generate revenue from that system right away. All right. Um, when you, it, it, no assembly required by DBOX. So previously on your other, on your uh, legacy uh, actuator business, you had to do final assembly uh, yourselves. And now the entire final assembly is done by your uh, uh, outsourced uh, manufacturing partners. Definitely. So as you were, uh, as you mentioned before that, we were doing assembly of a couple of components, but what we want to move for theatrical, commercial, and even consumer to volume production, we work with third parties that are able to build. We're protecting our IP. We're having all that managed specifically, but we have big partners that now are able to get thousands and thousands of units getting shipped directly from their factory directly to consumer. So yes, it increased for us or are, are the cost we need to operate the business, but as well the time to send that to consumers. And are, are the G5 uh, system, is it gonna be in new theatrical seats and basically uh, uh, replace all the legacy uh, actuators when you sell systems or is it sort of the new and improved and there'll be some legacy uh, actuator business that will go on to let's say the lower value markets or some segments of your market. Yeah, so so what is the more important thing is of course actuator is the system that is the hidden system as part of an application being under a seat, being into simulator. The most, uh, the, the most simplification I can do around that is in the past when it was built it was more industrial driven in terms of component. And now the architecture is more, much more modern with the standard cable, standard uh, standard cards, etc. So, so it it it's it simplified the way to outsource that business, and it and as as well simpler for people that are integrating our solution. So yes, it's moving from a let's say a more old architecture to a modern architecture. So that is tr the transition of the G five on top of some benefits. And, and, and is that what drives you? you and your last point uh, on the right uh, hand uh, box here on the slide, it allows you to target larger addressable market. Is that because it's a more sort of plug inable system where you can outsource it to your partners or it's smaller or, or what makes it uh, allow you to target a larger addressable market? Well, one of the reasons is, is in the past, our actuator, if if, if it have sim still were getting used by integrator that had to be quite technical to do some stuff right now, because as you say, it's more seamless and easier. It, it helps us to many people that are less the key distributor to be able to integrate that into their product or resell that uh, and, and be more user friendly for the consumer. So this is a big part of what we're saying is a much addressable, uh, more res reseller and distributor that are able to, to, to use that actuator into their exper experiences. And, uh, and feedback from clients or, or uh, 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 companies that you're presenting this to, it, it's resonating with them? It, they, they like how it sort of looks and works and so forth? It's really good. So we had good, really good feedback. And as you know, with uh, all those influencers, there's a system that can be tested and you can do on YouTube clip. So the as we're saying, people like what we brought to the table. D-Box is still con is considered to be the creme de la creme in terms of quality of experiences. And yeah, a lot of the benefit that we were bringing to the plate were appreciated. So right now I would say much more positive feedback than hiccups. All right. Um, should we move on to the next section? Yeah. So theatrical, and we'll take a bit of on that section as people and most shareholders love that business model. So let's move to the other slide. So first, uh, to remembering it's important. Uh, it's all about creating more footprint, more, more screens, more seats to have, of course, more consumer, which drive more right for use for us on the financial basis with high margin. So first, on September 22nd, we announced an, an agreement to install D-Box Aptic Recliner Seat in 36 new auditorium uh, at 12 additional Cinemark locations. This increased our throughput with Cinepark in the U.S. to more than 300 screens. So this really proved that 
that Cinemark knows what moviegoers are looking for and the advantage that debugs bring to their premium offering, which is now the most important thing for cinema. Next slide. Another key and uh, important uh, uh, circuit for us, Australia, which is part of the Wanda AMC family, so a big circuit around the world is OITS. So uh, second to the end of the Q2, on October 27, we announced an agreement with OITS, which has proven to be a great partner in Australia. Uh, just to say for the people that know less, OITS, OITS has close to 400 screens in Australia, one of the two main circuits down there. And we announced that, that DBoxic would be installed in seven additional OITS locations across Australia by the end of 2023. This would bring the number of OITS locations deployed to 22 by the end of next year. And what is interesting as well, many of them are full-fledged DBox auditoriums, a full auditorium with DBox seats. Next slide. We always have question around the footprint. So on this slide, you can see what our theatrical footprint looks like today and where we expect to be in a few years as we look to strengthen our leadership position. Today, we have approximately 810 screen equipped with DBox technology. Uh, David I alluded to that previously. It's really important for us to visibility of revenue. So we have 69 auditorium in our backlog, awaiting installation. And you can see in, in two to three years time, we expect the bug to be in, in a thousand or more auditorium around the globe. So again, more screen, more fans, more right for use for us and, and more profit on the bottom line. All right. With the, you, you mentioned the screens here. Can you, like, obviously you said some screens are full D-box theaters, other ones just have the back bunch of rows, a third, a quarter, a half. Can you give it any sort of metric as to, like, on average, how many seats per screen are D-box enabled or what the, is the trend going more towards fully enabled theaters with uh, the seats in there? Any sort of insight or perspective you can give on that? Yeah, so, so what is important to see in the, the, the full screens to, to section is, is two different strategic paths that differ from exhibitor to exhibitor. The interesting part of the, I will, I will call that the, the, the section path, which is usually a margin, I would say 15 to 30% of its auditorium. So it could be from 10 seats to 40 seats if you have, let's say, 150 uh, seats auditorium. The interesting part around that is it allows theatricals to convert only a part of their room, which is the part that the, the most, uh, mo the heavy movie goers, the people are coming in, come often. And it's allowed them to do multiple locations so providing that e-box experience to consumer close to their home. So that's, so a Cinemark is moving in that model mostly, a Cineplex is moving that model. We talk about 300 screen with Cinemark or 100 screen with Cineplex. These are the model. You can compare that to a business class, right? Into a plane when you have standard, premium, and business class. So this is really interesting and improved the ROI because as we said, 15 to 20% of the movie goer by 50% of the number of seats, the heavy movie goers. One of the trends that has increased as well on the other side was definitely to cinema that wanted to bring a consumer and sell them to a concept, a concept of a room. And that's well, a couple of exhibitors such as OITS are saying, I will be creating some kind of VIP rooms. They're doing full recliners. So it's going to be between 50 seats to 70 seats. And there will be a full concept of buying a ticket for a D-box room. And, and for them, that's what they sell the concept. This is really more uh, uh, easier when you have bigger city. Uh, so because you have the traffic to convert a high arts ball. And the, the result have been great. So this, again, different stage strategy but two strategic validation. And yes, and uh, uh, generally I would say probably that 90% of our screen are probably sold to, 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 to sections, maybe a 10% roughly that are trending, I would say in terms of trend that would be trending to full, full, to a full, full, uh, full screen. All right, and how are the movie theaters doing and the, uh, the attendance draws with the uh, the big theaters are, are the and the whole theater versus streaming uh battle that's uh going on are are are, uh, are moviegoers coming back to the theater well i'll talk about a couple left in and i will play the, the the myth versus reality first people were saying that streaming will kill the theatrical business it's not doing that. Even you saw Amazon Prime presented the, the power of the ring directly in the theaters. 
and Netflix as well was going into theaters, big blockbuster movie needs to make money both in theatrical and streaming. So for first, it didn't happen. There's been a negotiation, of course, with content going to streaming directly and content that would be protected that is, uh, for the theaters. And of course, that window, there's been a window that is sufficient that has been negotiated. So between those COVID trial and error specifically, this is for their big bluster will go to theater with, with a window of, of collaboration. And even the streaming are looking to bring their big, their, their big smooth movie to start on the screen. So this is trend number one. Trend number two, it was there before COVID, is it's a premium offering. This was already the case pre-COVID that the box office was growing mainly by premiums such as debug that were that were bringing a reason for people to go to the movie. And I could be saying that this has even accelerated following the COVID. So people are still coming to the theater, but they want to have the biggest experiences. You're better to pay a premium of eight dollars, three dollars, five dollars, and to get that. That for some, for the people that's for three, for content and doing that at home. So this is the interesting part for the theatrical. Immersive is there, window protection is there, and even streaming company are going to theaters. And lastly, I could be saying, Martin, is this is a comparison. I won't be providing the figures, but lastly, our occupancy rate through our seat are higher per seat than they were pre-COVID. So that means that they're more prepared per seat. So that this is again a trend about what people are looking for. So this is for us really interesting in terms of current, but as well as future. Uh, how are the theater companies doing in terms of their balance sheets and being able to like, there, there was the, like, there were some messed up balance sheets before. I think some of those have been cleaned up. Do they have the money to invest on in these uh, projects and, and how, what's your sense of how aggressively they're pushing forward on it? Well, it, I'll do, I could be saying uh, we, we, we must be doing something good, but when you're looking at the, even the, on the screen right now, 69 screen backlog, and we announced a lot since the pre-COVID, I would be saying that this proved the value that pe for people to have a good financial situation, they need to bring customer and D-Box bring customer. But your question, it's, it's true that of course, some industry have been hit and, and, and theatrical has been one of them. I would be saying that you have, I want to say it's 50-50, but yes, you do have some circuit that are more managing to get out of that COVID. So they spend less. Doesn't mean that they don't spend, but they have less capex. But now they're going more to a normal basis. And, and it has been some circuit, the one that I've been, uh, I would say, better managed from a financial point of view that have been quite aggressive getting out of the COVID and getting that leadership to bring consumer. But it's true, Martin, some of the, we have some circuit that we're talking and we won't be taking their risk that uh, they, they'll still have probably a year to, or to re-arrive to a proper balance sheet. The one that were more debt, the one that tried to consolidate a lot of the business and to get a lot of debt for acquisition pre-COVID, this is probably the one that are having a tougher time as they, they spend a lot on acquisition, but still probably right. a year for them. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, um, I think I hit all the main points on the theatrical side. Anything you want to uh, address before we switch over to the Q&A? Quick things, uh, another opportunity that will be with us is as we're having strategic uh, uh, connection with those one, as you know, theatrical are bringing, are bringing uh, are becoming entertainment centers. So opportunity that we have in our sleeve, like racing and things like that will be thing that's going to be appearing as well in cinema that are starting to happen. So we have that opportunity of cross-selling from other division to our theatrical partners. That would be my additional statement in terms of uh, cross-selling opportunity for D-Box. All right. Um, we're going to switch over to questions. And I, I guess this one's coming from uh, myself. Just uh, you, you focus here on the financials. And as you said, you wanted to focus on one segment of, of the business. Uh, can you just... Uh, there, there, there's some questions here on the video game side. Can you talk about the home entertainment side of your business? Give us a little update on how things are, are going there. Yeah, Martin, uh, I'm going to short. I have to say I'm really excited because what is happening in the kind of discussion we have right now. But I have to say, I have to say that for today, uh, even if we believe we have an exciting update to share with you over the next couple of, 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 of weeks and months, we prefer to wait until that time to further discuss. So the only thing I'll say, Mar Martin, is Yes, uh, we are, uh, as we say on our, our latest assumption to deploy our cooler this year, but in terms of new things on the gaming, et cetera, just saying excited, 
but more news to come. Does DBox track its market share of box office? If so, how is that trended versus 2022 versus 2019? Sure. Yes. So the the trend that we are we're even if we're not the big well in the in the immersive we're one of the biggest in the world to do that. But of course, on the box office, it's more limited. But our percentage of the box office is gaining momentum on the growth of the industry. So meaning we have. We are gaining more as a percentage of market share of the box office than the industry is growing. Gotcha. So yes, and, uh, and regarding the, uh, th- so there's a question here. How many theatrical locations have, because I guess they're multiplexes, have more than one theater with D box seats in it? That's good. So, so, so first for me, I say that the business opportunity for us is to be maximum, I would say probably in three locations that you can be. I would be saying that in the past, uh, Martin, most of the cinema had one. Cinemarks mainly has two, and now Cinemark is moving, as we saw in the announcement, to the real location. But uh, so, so this is the part. Cineplex is mainly one. So this I would be saying on most of the screen, it's one. It's, it's one, uh, maybe at uh, seventy percent, and maybe two for twenty percent of the screens. But that's where we're moving to getting one movie. But sometimes you have multiple blockbusters that come in row during big section. So that's what they want to roll movie. So that's why Cinemark went from one to two to three per location. Okay. So they're trying to get more theaters within so they can have, because all the blockbusters kind of come out at the same time in the uh, springtime and at Christmas to make sure yeah. there's room for Black Panther and Avatar to have the, those right. types of Definitely. Seats. And even in Avatar, when you have Avatar, they might put two. But after that, as you know, the new is coming in. So, yes, they roll out getting one screen with the box with the Avatar and your one with Black Panther. So that helps us for the other one. So that's where people are moving. So that's our question. We won't be, we'll never be in 10 screens debug. It doesn't make any sense because most of the box office uh, numbers are coming from maximum 20 movies that generate 80% of the box office in terms of number of tickets from an Hollywood point of view. So this is what, uh, and uh, by 60 movie, you get pretty much everything that you want for, on an annual basis. Gotcha. There's been some big headlines over the last uh, few weeks about Meta slash Facebook and their Meta universe and them cutting back, uh, uh, whatever, 10,000 uh, jobs and so forth. That's related in in somewhat to the, the haptic world of having more uh, feedback. Uh, does that have any flow through to you or does uh, can you give any perspective on sort of the metaverse and your haptic systems and what meta is doing? All right, a really good question. So first, it has no impact for us right now. What is important is haptic and meta have a connection, a destination point in the future, in the long future. So, so meta, as you know, is... Well, nobody knows what knows is Meta, but what they're trying to build is a place where people will get many type of experiences and they're trying to figure it out, right? And this is probably five, six, seven years down the road. So where, where we have a link with Meta is, of course, where people are feeling and experiences. You would want to have that experience being a concert, being a relation, be as cool as, and that's where Aptic, what we bring, bringing the body into the experience as a direction and a connection down in the future. For Smart Martin, I'll make a, excuse me, a cumber ribbon. We are working on mini meta, meaning if experience, ver- everything is going virtual, right? To go esports is going virtual, simulation is going virtual, concert are going virtual. I, I call that small meta. So we are working with small ecosystem that are trying to convert their, their, their numeric, digital, and, and virtual experiences by bringing the body into it. So for us, that's where it's the box focus management and where we take decision is where do we feel there's some money to be made short, short term, long term and mid term. And what are the ecosystem that are driving revenue monetization, et cetera. So that's why we are in esports. That's why we are in gaming. That's why we are in racing, because we see a path, a monetization path that is not 65 years down the road, right? So this, but your question is really right. So Meta, I think, was building something and it's going to be taking a lot of time to get what they need. But there's many, many, many. And that's the trend about Aptic when we're saying that that market is growing by 30% a year and to be 28 billion by 2026. This is where small cluster of experience are getting built and you need to find the one that have traction and monetization. 
All right. Uh, we should get uh, wrapping up uh, here. Are there any uh, final uh, comments you, you want to say? And then I guess as well, you mentioned on the, the gaming side of things, we should be expecting some news flow. Can you, uh, not obviously exactly what, but what sort of news flow should it in fact in, in investors be looking out for over the next uh, three, six, nine months? Yeah, perfect. So definitely I'll go quickly on gaming. I've had a couple of bullet points to finish. So if you want to move to the next slide, and uh, uh, please, uh, Martin, is first around gaming. We used to follow. We said that the Cooler Master Chair will be lended and have impact on financial. This to follow. We said we were in discussion with other gaming peripheral accessories company. This to follow. We say as well, we want to get closer to content provider into gaming. This to follow. So Martin, what definitely needs to be driven is getting that chair, getting revenues, and getting more partnership. And as I said, it's upcoming weeks and months, so I'm not postponing that. And yes, in the, in a, in a subsequent uh, update, we're going to be providing more guidance around that. As we said, we decided to pick some topic for today. So this is important. We are not sliding away to what we mentioned to the shareholders. And yes, uh, thing, nice things to, to, to communicate shortly. On my last day statement, Martin, is is uh, looking ahead, um, we, we are expecting a strong second half to our fiscal year. Not only is our order book the biggest it's been since the start of the pandemic, orders are fully booked for Q3 and substantially filled for Q4. So again, even if a tough economy, our six month village visibility, we like what we have specifically. And as we say, we are pushing as much to deliver growth. Another thing we mentioned, we remain laser focused on profitable growth and are proactively doing that to mitigate any inflation that may be our supply chain issue. So this is more important for us, growing the top line and growing that with profit and managing that no matter what's going to be the economic, the economic uh, concept. We mentioned about the industry is there, just mentioned this growing industry. Yes, Meta, but a lot of things are going virtual. So our job is to be laser focused of finding with the debug size, what are the ones that provides the more value and gets monetization in a reasonable time frame. Um, and the, for me, really excited, Martin. So really excited about the year we're building, really about the year we're looking to deliver. And definitely even if there's a challenge down there, do building on the power of Aptic, do believe in all the key things we have from Dbox. And, uh, and, and thanks again for all the shareholders in a tough environment, make sure we're trying to focus on operation. So that's what we control, revenue, margin, EBITDA, and uh, valuation. Thanks a lot, Martin. That's our, our latest statement. All right, Sebastian, David, thanks a lot for taking the time to bring us up to date on uh, D-Box. Uh, thank you, have a great day, and we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thank you, Martin. Thank you all for your support. Thank you.